Welcome to Watching Silent Films. This is Zifong, and with me are my uh, co-host Lily. She's back. Hello, Lily. Hey, what's up? And uh, on the on with us again is Adam. He's kind of kind of gonna be our. Uh, he's not really on probation, but he's like uh, on trial, I guess. Well, maybe not on trial. I don't know what the better best term, the uh, best use of term is. But he's hanging out. Well, we're, we're just hanging out nervous. with him. We'll see what happens. You know, <laughs> that's how we roll this podcast. It's super. Super professional, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So what we do on this podcast is uh, wa- uh, pick a movie or a series of shorts and watch you and talk about it. That's that's what we do. And this week, we're going to talk about uh, continuing our uh, filmography of F.W. Murnau. Um, this is either the second or the third available feature that's available, surviving film to us. It's called The Haunted Castle. And I think it's 1921. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we're gonna get there. Uh, any, any, uh, just before we get there, any classic film that you've seen since we last chatted on the last podcast? Either of you, if you have time. You don't well, have I was to gonna have say, anything. I noticed on Facebook you had liked the Cinderella post right before I liked the Cinderella post, so I know we both watched it. Did you watch it by George well, Melier, eighteen ninety? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it. <laughs> you know, twenty I years ago. Oh, yeah. lucky you. <laughs> but. Uh, I haven't seen it recently, but uh, that's that's just George. You know, that's this that's how he does things. He likes to. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So see that on canopy. So we're both on um, the Facebook groups and in in Facebook groups you can search for silent films, and there's a uh, at least somewhere north of eight to ten, either private or public silent film groups. Um, and some of them are including like early talkies, uh, films of the 30s, maybe 40s, at least film, at least, you know, silent plus maybe a, a couple decades uh, beyond the uh, the silent era. And so that's like classic film groups, you know, and uh, they often share either shorts or like Giorgio Mayo movies like that and the clips and say, we like this movie and so forth and so on. So sometimes we'll see, uh, you know, uh, shorts like that and... Uh, yeah, it's cool. Sometimes you Yeah, just... that one I actually I saw his other shorts and then I stopped at Cinderella and then I just never got back to it. Uh, yeah, he's so now really I'll, pro- I'll prolific for uh one of the earlier pioneers of cinema, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So he's one of the first people to know about if they if they look at this. Oh yeah. So anything else uh you guys watched recently that belongs in the cl- to the classic realm. Are you all set, Lily? Or sh- I, I mean, know where no, that was in. technically the only film I've been able to watch. Because besides... you've been you've been creating them. You you haven't been uh, <laughs> watching them. <laughs> Wish I could say I had a better hand at creating some of the movies I was in. But, That's uh... okay. You did your part. So, <laughs> uh, well, I've seen a couple. Uh, have you seen The Student in Prague, 1913? Remind me the the plot. Uh, Paul Wegner, you've seen um, the Gollum, right? Uh, a long time ago. Again, <laughs> okay. Uh, Most of Paul my Wegner... silent film watching days were in the early two thousands, if you recall my story. So, oh, I didn't know if you rewatched. Um, yeah, well, not Paul recently. Wegner. I'm I'm more new to this. I mean, I'm really uh, nailing it down. Uh, Paul Wegner, uh, he created the Gollum and he starred in it. Well, he did something earlier that was kind of like a Faust um, mo- uh, story. Uh, and it was like a combination of a, a, a few other things. But basically, uh, it takes place in Prague. And when it starts, it shows him and the guy who, who did the screenplay looking at Prague, you know, for real. And then it go- jumps into the story where he's a, he's a poor student and he wasn't sure what he was going to do about making money. And he was very popular and he was... Um, the best uh, fencer in Prague. They made a big deal out of that. Um, so he was kind of depressed while everyone else was having a good time. And then this um, older man named Scott Benelli, uh sat down at his table with him and asked to go to his room so they could have a talk. Uh, they go there and he says, what would you do for untold wealth? I said, could you give me something in the room? Anything in the room, could I have it? And I'll give you untold wealth. And he said, sure, because there's nothing in the room. Basically, what he did was he took his uh, image from the mirror and 
that's I, one of the first times, or at least a very, you know, successful time of creating doubles. Uh, so it's it's like the first evil twin story, um, and he uh, this so he got the money in, in um, you know his payment, but his he no longer had a reflection. Uh, there's usually a love story, and this uh, countess was horse, horseback riding with someone that her father told her she had to marry, which was basically a first cousin. She told him up front, "I don't love you, but I'll go I'll go along with it." Um, she fell off a horse. Meanwhile, the student sees her, saves her, falls in love with her, uh, and basically woos her now that he has money. Meanwhile, there's this gypsy woman that follows him around along with a double. She's climbing buildings. She's hopping on the back of carriages. No one seems to see her, but as far as I know, she was human. Um, I don't know if she was just there to cause trouble. Uh, she would take a letter from the fiance and show it to her fiance. I mean, uh, between the, uh, the two lovers, show it to his fiance. He asked the student to uh, to do a duel. The father of the countess said, um, "Look, I know you're the best uh, fencer in, uh, or the best swordsman in um, all of Prague. Please don't kill him. He's my heir." Well, his double went ahead and killed him before he even got there. Um, I just thought it was a very good film. They cleaned it up. It was it's in good um, shape. Uh, you can do it in auto uh, translate on YouTube and uh, watch it that way. Um, I, it was really uh, cute how um, at the beginning of the uh, movie, they were behind um, curtains on the stage and the curtains would open up and it would show the, the actor and the name of the character. And then it would do that two or three times. Uh, I just thought that was fun. Um, the second one was The Man Who Laughs. You and I talked about that before. Yeah, it's I bought, predecessor to Joker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I bought that uh, the latest um, restoration, and it's absolutely brilliant. The um, you know visually, it's as clear as you can you can get it. Um, it was by Victor Hugo, who also did I think um, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I'm not sure if he did uh, uh, Phantom of the Opera or not, um, but the Berkeley Silent Film Orchestra uh, played with the film, and it just went a lot of it perfectly. Um, and I just thought, to me, that was one of the few silent films I didn't feel like I had to work at understanding it or putting it together or even enjoying it. It just, it was just natural. Uh, the humor was good. The acting was good. Um, I just thought it worked all the way around. And that's it. Hmm, yeah, very definitely. Interesting. To uh... Massive classics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was yeah, it, it was just amazing the whole, th uh, just how clear it was. You could, you could just see everything. It was, it was like it was shot recently. Right, and of course, Victor. Um, I mean, uh, Conrad Veidt is pretty good. Uh, he, he, I guess he couldn't talk with the uh, oversized dentures in his mouth, so it was a good thing it was silent. Uh, <laughs> Because he couldn't have done his lines, uh, but yeah, it was a good film. That is one I've been wanting to check out anyway. So it's good to hear your commentary about it, and then go see it myself. I don't think it's available online. That's what made me buy the the Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. um, but I got it was just released this year, as far as I know, in 4K, like everything else. Um, and the music was just perfect plus they give you the option of playing previous music uh it was just um yeah it was just the, the acting the humor she, you know the uh the girl the woman that was trying to win him away from uh the girl that he really loved um she just what she was just a party girl that just wanted to have a good time and it just the way they played it it was just done very sophisticated is it uh dia the uh, that's the blind girl. Yeah. Uh, Duchess Josiana is. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's the other one. It's and Olga... I guess her mother had um, her through um, the previous king. So it's um, it, she's the illegitimate daughter of King James the right. Second. Um, 
it starts off with uh, the main character's name is Gwynplaine, which is I don't think I've seen that name anywhere else. Um, his father refused to bow to King James or kiss his ring, so they basically uh, gave him to the gypsies. Uh, oh, the Kabachi. I, I I can't remember how it's spelled out. Um, but there was a name for these gypsies who carved the smile on his face so he would laugh at his father's suffering for all eternity, basically. Right. Uh, and then he just became a very successful clown. Um, the person who took him in, he uh, he was in a, a, a very severe snowstorm, and he found this woman that was dead, but she was holding a baby, and that was Dia, and she was blind. And so they grew up together, but uh, they fell in love with each other, but he always felt self-conscious because, in his mind, she doesn't really know what he looks like. Um so it ended the way you'd figure it would, where she loves him after all. Um, but the guy who was uh, playing, uh, putting on the shows, I guess it was a circus type thing, but his show would be uh, more like Shakespeare, only better. That's how he would push it. Uh, his name was Ursus. Um, yeah, the whole, like I said, the whole thing, it was just easy to watch. Um, there was no draggy points. There was no stiff acting. Everything, everybody did their job correctly. That's because it's uh, towards the end of the silent era is why. Because by the time yeah. the late 80s rolled around, yeah, uh, everyone has had tremendous amount of experience already. And yeah. you're looking at mature productions and people are already, you know, run running everything like a wild oil machine. It was American too. Yeah, it's um, because it's uh, Universal Pictures. At that point, they were coming off of Victor Hugo's The Hunchback, and so they were like, "Yeah, hey, let's let's do another Victor Hugo, which is you know the author." I'm not sure, is... but I think Dia, the one who played Dia, she was in the hunt uh, and the Phantom of the Opera. So I think right. So so the, the point yeah. is that you know they they love they love the literary resort the source material yeah yeah and so they just kept it going you know between right you know phantom les miserables and the man who laughs which is a you know uh, uh, a novel that he wrote victor hugo so right right it just yeah. continues on he's just you know like today i think it's still pretty popular victor hugo's works just across the board oh yeah but um yeah very popular work the man who laughs um I can't remember the last time if, if I can barely remember if, what I had for breakfast. So <laughs> <laughs> it was um, toast. <laughs> I I do remember the a little bit not, when you were describing the plot of the Student of Prague. It is the first uh, one of the first, if not the first, thing to talk about the concept of doppelganger, right? Which is like a, I think you're right. A psychiatry. Uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Freud. Yeah, where uh, the whole notion of there's uh, some duality. He's talking yeah, about like Doctor Jekyll. Yeah, yeah. There's always two sides to the person, and so this whole right. concept uh, came evolved out of this this idea, I guess, or, or storyline. Uh, well, this from... is more fa- uh, Faust. Than um than the Doctor Jekyll, right? Uh, it's he sold it's, his soul. Yeah, it was inspired by Faust, but also I think there was uh, Edgar Allan Poe's story too. I think well you're as, right. Yeah, there's a yeah. bunch of inspirations. This is not just Faust. So the point is, it's a whole it's a whole concept of like selling your soul to the devil for yeah. whatever, and then you 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 know you you. I just didn't know what was up with the gypsy woman because she was just out of nowhere just following him around and causing trouble <laughs> uh they didn't explain who she was or why she was doing this or anything yeah i, I think th- some of that also makes allusions to um it, this is i'm trying to reach back many years now but I, as i recall there's something there's some ties to um oh, what was that thing uh who is that the portrait of oh dorian gray of Dorian Gray, it's similar, yeah. not exactly the same, right? But the whole notion that there's something in the mirror, and you know, it's yeah. it, 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 those themes are all kind of tied together, you know. Well, the Countess freaked out when they were both next to her mirror. She was in it, and he wasn't. She's like, "What?" Right. <laughs> yeah, because it's gone. So it, that it's the whole notion of like 
mirrors and souls and you yeah, know whenever yeah. they started playing with that it's very popular in literature too they did they did a pretty good job and um i guess the guy who created the illusion was pretty good at what he was doing the only mess up i saw was when they first took the image out of the mirror they they closed they had the door closed in one double but open in another so they kind of look like they walked through a closed door so that's the only <laughs> screw up i saw uh, but otherwise they you know cuz i looked And that's it. Cool. All right. Well, I'm glad you 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 uh, brought that back up for our listeners who are maybe uh, either curious or you know is interested well, in that. It's on YouTube. You know. Yeah, go check them out. At least uh, one of them is. The other one, you might have to get the the, uh, the subtitles copy. are Portuguese, but there is uh, if you go into the functions uh, after you bring up the subtitles, you can auto translate to whatever language you want. Yeah, it's the uh, mm. Google AI. I'm just saying it for the people listening. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty cool because you can basically, as long as it's access to uh, the text. Well, there has to be subtitles. There. Yeah, there has to be text, to and it. once there's right. text, you can auto translate that to any language you want. That's that they're uh-huh. capable of doing it. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Lily. You hadn't seen anything else beyond that short. No, I'm trying to even think of any movie, but I, I don't know. That's the thing. If I'm not watching a silent film for our podcast i really haven't i won't watch anything it's weird yeah. <laughs> no you watch it in pieces that's what you do <laughs> yeah I, I, oh my god people get a kick out of that so bad like yeah, yeah i've seen that movie five How minutes much? of it oh yeah but, you know like <laughs> certain parts have I either mean, one of you heard of comics back in like the 50s and 60s where they did comics of um like special stories or uh yeah it would have to be books i think well they have one on this on the um uh, the man who laughs. Uh, I haven't looked at it yet, but I can see it through um, Hoopla, which is my digital library. And um, yeah, I want to see how they handle it. But they they're pretty straightforward. And, you know, they just tell the story like Tale of Two Cities. Um, there's a whole there's a whole lineup out there uh, that they've restored it and put it out in digital, so you can just you know cool. see something in a simple way. That's another good resource. Thanks for bringing yeah. that up. All right. Well, I don't think I've had a chance to check anything out myself. I've been uh, a little bit busy at work. So anyway, so uh, with, with that being said, let's uh, let's keep rolling here. Um, we're going to talk about The Haunted Castle, which is, I think, the second, maybe third, maybe second. I, I, I can't remember now, but I think, oh, wait, let me check. Okay, filmography, lost, lost, lost. Most of these are lost. Yeah. The first film, a fully, well, most of the footage that's there is Journey to Night, which we just talked about, also 1921. So this is the second one that is fairly available to us, The Haunted Castle. 1921, directed by F.J. Mimerno. It the, the plot summary, real quick, is about a count who arrives at uh, somebody's house, castle, and just kind of crashes the party. Uh, they, they, it appears to be a group of friends who are going to go on a hunt for, I guess, some sort of deer, maybe? I don't know what they're hunting, but whatever they're hunting, <laughs> it's like, the, you know, they all gather together in this castle and uh, it's like a social group. And so he arrives there mysteriously and we don't know what's up with him. And it turns out he supposedly has uh, killed his own brother uh, over just uh argument or something. And his sister-in-law, or was a, her, his sister-in-law, arrives at the castle. And, you know, there's a conflict, you know, of uh, how they're going to kind of be with each other. Uh, so let's high level what the plot is. Um, let's go to Lily. Uh, what do you think of this uh, particular movie? Ooh, I loved it so much. I know that everything about this was restored, but it just felt so good, so clean. Um, it was just so even even if it was or you know because it was ah, I love this movie. <laughs> Um, it just felt so much more pristine with the way it was tinted. The colors seemed so vibrant. The color grades just matched every scene so well. And I think one one of my favorite parts about it, it had so much visual depth. Mm. Um, oh, and like, yeah. just a comparison, 
I have not seen Knives Out, uh, but they use a lot of that similar depth in their yep. movie, and I've seen <laughs> enough. You seem to know a lot about these Shut movies up. you haven't seen. <laughs> Shut up, Epoch, whatever. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I've seen little clips. We know this. <laughs> but yeah, with this film in particular, I really enjoyed how Murnau has the set put back and the camera, you know, closer to the audience to always get that perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's so much that you observe that you're not always alone, but it just feels, I don't know, like, maybe that's the idea, like, the overall thing that something else is there observing? I Possibly. That's, like, really getting into the scope of the movie. But I I think it was a hit for a silent film. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what else. I mean, I can really observe about the film until we start uh, analyzing it. But go Adam? watch this movie. <laughs> yeah, okay. Adam, what'd you think? Um, it brought up some questions about the story itself. Um, I love the uh, model. Uh, you know, like I said, I grew up with '60s television, so you saw models a lot, especially with uh, sci-fi. So this model, I just love the way it looks so fake that you're almost looking at a dollhouse that's interactive. It's just, uh, they just made the most out of it. It rained on it. It was sunlight. It was dark. It was, uh, they couldn't show that model enough. Um, it was a go good ahead. model. I didn't realize it wasn't real until later on. I'm thinking it was a miniature. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just, yeah, I just love when something doesn't look quite real. Uh, I grew up watching those super marionette mo uh, shows. So uh, to me, it was just like, it looked like we were in for one of those, but then all of a sudden we saw people. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what the um, tinting, you know, the thought behind the tinting, though, was? Because sometimes it would be um, sepia tone, and then suddenly there'd be no color. And I can understand why they did it in some versions, you know, like when uh, Osh just, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Osh uh, first came in. Uh, suddenly the color was gone, um, and then they would switch it back and forth, and it didn't always seem to be a reason for it, so I wasn't sure why. Uh, generally, the tinting represents the, the lighting in the fictional world of the story of the m m film you're trying to tell. Uh -huh. So, like, if you're inside the physical house, usually it's like a golden hue right. color because there's a, a lamp or a light that has turned on. And if you remember one of the guests, uh, not the main character, but the guy who dreamt an arm was coming through the window to get him. The, the comic relief, yeah. Yeah, When so when he was sleeping and he t had his lights off, it was dark blue, which signifies night. Right, So right. if it's dark blue tinted, that means there's no uh, light on. And that means that, do you remember when he physically pressed the um, the old school switch? Right, right. To turn on the light, which actually in mass here, a lot of houses still have that, by the way. <laughs> yep, yep, <laughs> Even stuff it. from the, yeah. But anyways, that reminds me of some of the houses that we've seen here locally. Oh, yeah. Um, anyways, what I was saying is um, when he physically, you know, he, you know, we did a jump cut, right? Edit, ed the editor, we, we did a cut between him stopping there and then cut to, oh, now it's uh, yellow tint. Because he turned on the light and it... Well, I understand it, the, yeah. that to that, but yes. why all of a sudden black and white, you know, without any tint? You know, oh, that's, I, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, always, that, that, that always has some sort of significance, right? So if there, you know, if there are circumstances and situations when the lights go out, like the special tints go out, it's usually for narrative purposes, right? So... Okay. Like I said, some of it I got, but some of it, it just, it, it's almost like they forgot to put it in. I mean, it's possible. I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't I doubt know. that. But also, I think sometimes uh, it is, uh, if it weren't for lost footage, it's probably intentional. So that could be just highlighting uh, uh, a grand entrance for this character that you, you just don't know what to make of. And so you, you strip the colors out and go, oh, this unusual character has arrived, right? I like the way they did reverse angles so you could, especially that uh, middle hallway they used a lot. I think it was like the second floor. Yeah. Uh, mostly you saw it with the stairs, but every once in a while they would turn it around. You're on the stairs looking out. I just thought that was, um, that seemed like a lot of effort. 
Right. Uh, is it all right to do, jump to a reveal? Because I had a question about that. Oh, sure. I mean, we're generally not spoiler free or anything like that. Just well, I because... just, I, I wanted to ask first before doing it. Sure, go um, ahead. Okay, Father Faramund, uh, obviously he turns out to be Osh at the very end. Yet there's, uh, in the credits, there's a different name for a different actor that plays Faramund. So I didn't know what that was about. Did they use a separate person? I don't know, but uh, I do know that at the end, there was a a real Father Faramund who did come through the gates, right? At the very last scene. Yeah, and you never saw him. So I don't, yeah, Yeah. I didn't know if that was the reason why there was a different actor. Maybe. Or if they just shows a different actor in there. Because he just moved around easier, or I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. That's another. It's a good question, yeah. but I don't know what the. You'd have to kind of uh, if they ever made a either a uh, a biography, or I don't know if he wrote a bi auto bio, but uh, some sort yeah. of biographical oh, information, or somebody who did research. On yeah, I the couldn't film find itself. it anywhere. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, you know, it's one of those like you know a movie from almost a hundred years ago some detail right. about that and you're like if we can find it <laughs> well, just you know what I mean the story didn't always make sense like why did the um the person who was uh, her um his brother her husband why where did he go for like a week or two and what they showed no reason for him to all of a sudden find religion you know he oh, just yeah. comes back and he found religion you know yeah, like yeah. out of nowhere right. there was like no explanation yeah, maybe that wasn't the important part. The important part was that uh, he had changed, and the important yeah. part was the marriage part. Do you remember in um, this goes back to last week's movie, uh, Journey to Dark? Remember, yeah. there was a, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was that movie. So you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a scene where I, I guess they're looking at the opera, right, with the yes. dancer, yeah, and. You remember in that scene, uh, after I mean, Myrna is only looking at the main character and the yeah, dancer. There, I remember that well. He was yeah. totally not interested in uh, a normal shot would be, which would you would show the audience for the op- or the dancing. You would show the orchestra. You would show everything else to kind of set up the the scene. But uh-huh. he didn't care. He's only interested in these characters, and I think he does that here too. Is that I I, I that's why I love this director so much. He's my favorite. Uh, of the well, I like that we talked about that movie first because you explained to me what I wasn't getting offhand, the placement of the characters on a wide shot on the stage itself and how it just goes back into the background and there's usually something going on. So now I was aware of that this time with this. And he does it again, right? He, he yeah. just keeps doing that. He, he, In the he beginning doesn't... with all the um, hunters not able to hunt. So they're all like strewn around this huge room. Uh, but I saw what you were saying. Right, and and that motif that he's been playing with in that first movie, I mean, I I bet every movie, he just continues yeah. on. I mean, all of his movies have stuff like this where there are just a huge amount of stuff happening in the back, in the middle ground, right. in the foreground, in the medium ground, and far away. And specifically to the thing that I address with you, which is that, you know, why did, did that whole uh, uh, sort of the 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 marriage between the you know the his sister-in-law and his brother you know when he came back he found religion well ultimately it didn't matter what that context was that would have wasted just more time i think the context was okay that he he i guess he i'm changed. used to having things explained uh, yeah so he changed and he and yeah. it altered their relationship that's really the the key part yeah he became and, um a monk basically and she's like oh my god the marriage is done mm. right and so that that's kind of his you know, after we were, uh, cause I you know, skill. he shut her off. Uh, you know, she, they were, she was used to a loving relationship and he basically shut her off. And right. she's like, Oh crap, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right. That, that's kind of the point I was trying to make is that he's laser sharp focus on character and story that yeah. any extra extraneous stuff, he would have stripped it out in the scripting stage is my guess. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like I said, I haven't done deep, research into this but knowing sort of some of the how he had done work in the past on the larger right. f- pictures you know like the Nosferatu's and the and beyond I mean that's just the way that he and many of his peers have done it and so he learned from the best and he, he, he utilized all of the skill sets that he 
he is equipped with and has trained with uh and he's you know he he uses that on on his yeah. films like this one which is that if you've got extra stuff let's just slap it off there's no point in throwing yeah. that in there if it's irrelevant to the central part of the plot which is it's about the relationship right between right. him and his wife it's about the relationship between the brother and you know the two brothers and you know what what happened between those it's it was set up as a mystery I don't even know why the brother was even accused. It just didn't seem like he was anywhere near them. Right. So that's kind of the whole, uh, you know, that's one of the motifs about this film is like, it's about gossiping. It's about um, deception, fake news, quote, unquote. It's about what's truth, (laughs) right? Is truth something that is a mob mentality where a bunch of mob accuses one another? And that's, that is fact. In fact, that was kind of the, cultural thing back then uh we still have some parts of that today but there's a lot more fact checking today than before but before there there's a lot of cultures which is based on what's called a shame-based culture which Mm -hmm. is that you know you can use shame and say shame shame this guy you know supposedly killed his brother like but you don't know the facts you just heard it from some gossip and you don't know for sure you know it was enough to put him in the jury you know in front of the jury right exactly so, Someone believed it to a point. And that's what I love about his movies is uh, it's often not just, you know. So if you if you just take like like last movie too, same th- same with this movie. If you just stripped everything out and just took a look at the plot, it's it's another yeah. melodrama, I'd say. And it's like, it's pretty straightforward. It, you know, if you just stripped it down so, to the basic elements, it's really yeah. nothing unique, I think, in terms of the story itself. Uh-huh. Because everyone and their grandma in that time probably was doing a story like this. Yeah. Um, what's I've different. I've seen a few. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what's different is his take on it. It's, it's because after Myrna's eye and his aesthetic and his approach to the direction, it is so unique onto himself that he can take what potentially could just be a straightforward, boring melodrama into something that's just what we call cinema. Right. It just, okay. he, he just elevates material everywhere. Right. And that's right. why in, in really popular movies like Nosferatu, when he gets his hands on a really juicy story like that, it really takes off, right? It, it combines his skill set of enhancing whatever story he has with an incredible, uh, rich story. Then, you know, that's what makes some of those big movies happen. In fact, uh, probably the next few movies we're going to watch are, are going to be some of those too because what's next? Uh, Haunted Castle... Burning Soul, I think is the Glen. I think it was Nosferatu, Phantom. So yeah, in the next few years, she'll j- really just be kicking off just amazing stuff, you know. Just yeah. Really incredible. Rich I noticed classes. he doesn't move the camera around that much, not even in Nosferatu. Right, but you know, do you need? But to? he did in Sunrise, right? Well, so I thought he was known for that when I saw Sunrise. Then I went well, that's back because and I'm like, no, that's because it, there's you know he needs to do that for that plot and that story, but he okay. doesn't need to for these, right? It's all about uh-huh. if the story calls for it or not. Um, but like I said, you know, going back to sort of the the film itself, this film, yeah. Uh, there's just, there's just. I, I think Lily pointed this out. There is just a lot of depth to the shots. It just oh, yeah. feels like it goes on and on and on into the back and all the all the way to the front. Yeah. And I just love the way he frames each of the shots. Mm-hmm. You know, now we call them in the scene, whatever, but. This is way before, you know, decades before the term was even coined, applied to films. Okay. I just love the way it looks, the aesthetics of it, the way like, yeah, you know, I, I've got that pulled out in the background here. I'm looking at it. It's like uh, there's a shot of the castle owner and the wife, right? They're strolling towards the, I guess it's the front door. Oh, that hallway is amazing. Yeah, there's a separate hallway at the top of the stair yeah. somewhere in the stairs, one of the stairs. And it's like... Oh, by the way, I don't know if you guys noticed. Uh, I pointed this out in the Nosferatu podcast. I didn't really highlight it in the last movie. I didn't really look for it. But I noticed it for sure in this movie. He's really in love with arches. And if you notice yes. that. Yes, yes. Like in Nosferatu, towards the end, when they land the ship and they land, Nosferatu, when he's traveling, like flying everywhere, there's a bunch of arches. And in this movie, right. I noticed a huge amount of arches, whether it's the large gate where people come in and out of riding horses to the hunt or the interior of this castle. He's choosing 
Yeah. Uh, the room. Especially rooms. that hallway. Yeah. Oh, that hallway and many uh, and the other checkered places. floor. Everything. Like, yeah. It was very busy. Yeah. Well, just the just the arches. There's something about yeah. the arches that's containing. Like, is it is something about framing these people in these arches that is containing sort of their lifestyle that's so grandiose, but also like it's really not middle class. It's far beyond that. It's a oh, high God, class yeah. society, and they're so far. Ab- above themselves that they're in this kind of lonely place if you look at this these uh castle mansions are are pretty cold and so like they're not really known for warmth you know and so it's like these large halls with these huge arches i feel like are framing our characters in their loneliness i think you know all these figures are kind of alone it really looked it yeah i liked when they went outside for that one sunny day oh yeah uh all those dogs, they just it just didn't seem to be an end to the amount of dogs that were coming out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just that alone, I, I was wondering how hard that was to even put together. Because right. animals aren't the easiest thing to, you know. No, and not running them over with horses. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> there were like a hundred dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was brilliant. You know, this thing was shot in 16 days. Oh, yeah. Yeah, by then, they're they're real slick, so... It's amazing well, you that guys cranking were talking up... about Charlie Chaplin took three years, <laughs> so this is something. Yeah, well, it's different because when you are a uh, employee for hire or a oh, contractor, yeah. really, you have to get cranking. Whereas Chaplin, his power was so extensive, yeah. he owned everything. Everybody was salary. That's unheard of even now. I just you know? listened to that earlier today before, uh, while I was working. Oh, thanks. So yeah. the scene by scene. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, that's I wanted to highlight that specific scene where they're walking towards the window and they're waiting for sort of the sister and her new husband to arrive at the castle. Yep. And yep. then when it cuts to the, the exterior, it's like green, right? So it's because it's dark yep. outside, right? But after they kind of come in, uh, I think what's really crazy is so the wife figure is standing like at the window looking out at the window and there is a light shown on her face and she's so far in the background. It's so far. Like it's just so far in the center of the frame. You barely notice it. And there's just a, uh, yeah, a drop of light, like highlighting her face. Uh, and it, but it's dark all around her and just the whole profile against the window. It's, it's like a painting, you know, it's super, super striking. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So they, I really I guess he had a special uh, skill he learned in India about prophesizing. Right, right. Uh, so I'm wondering where um, he was prophesizing maybe who the real killer was. Oh, right. That plot point. Yeah, that's um, that's interesting, too, because um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what's I don't know if it's German specifically or cinema. They're obsessed with. uh so the mystic mysticism, you know, from uh, yeah. the far, not the far east, but the east in, in general. There's there's some mystical, exotic. Well, that's where the shadow learned how to be invisible. <laughs> yeah, see, it's there. <laughs> there's this obsession about stuff from there, you know. But anyway, yeah. that's a whole other <laughs> rabbit trail. Batman might have gone there too. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. but uh, because we we wa- we reviewed a a Conrad Veidt uh, cameo movie about that too. Uh, I think it was uh, Fear with Robert Wien. And right. Yeah. He did. He did a thing about the the Indian mysticism about statues and stuff. Mm-hmm. But anyways, back yeah, to the I'm film. Sure. So if you're, I'm sharing my, you know, listeners can't see it, but if you look at the screen I just shared, you can see the uh, sort of that that figure uh, in the distance. You can see that, right? Mm-hmm. It's incredible. Oh, now I'm seeing it. Okay. Yeah. It's it's I just switch. Incredibly beautiful. Uh, yeah. And this shot, the way it's composed, the arches, the lamp, mm-hmm. the, st- the, yeah. the 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 what do you call that? Staircase arm, uh, railings, uh, I guess. Banister, marble, or something. You know, it's banister. Oh, it's just this whole shot is just incredible, and that's what I love about his films. It's and she turns around, and the lighting is just incredible. Mm-hmm. That reminds yeah. me of like, and she walks into different lighting across the hallway. It's this is really long. It really. Uh, ties together and I bet really Scott was uh, 
not by this movie specifically, but I'm sure by classic movies too. But in Blade Runner, uh, there was also a scene where one of the characters walked up into a light where a shadow passes over her head, you know, I think the Android yeah. character, and she revealed herself. It's just, you know, that's another great example of a movie with great lighting. But they all yeah. came from somewhere, and I bet they were inspired a lot by lighting from classic films like this, you know. that or, or paintings. Yeah, or paint, or you know, Renaissance paintings, right? Because yeah. they all right. have to ins- inspire one another somehow, somewhere, you know. But the lighting's incredible on in this, right? So. Oh, there, there was the comic relief for a second. Yeah. And then here's, you know, as the horses enter. Yeah, with I love the, that. The arch, right? More arches, yeah. more lamps. I just, I just love the the framing of all these, you know? So he every must single, have really studied paintings. Every single uh, uh, frame, you could just pause and it becomes like a painting you know the way that yeah. the doors collapse one another like there's there's a scene where the luggage is being brought in by mm-hmm. one of the servants and there's like three four doors down the hall and then there's a painting yeah. in the background i didn't i don't i don't know who who or what it is yeah. but there's paintings on the walls everything is intentional where the chandelier is you know where the the, the door edges are uh there's some there's always something in the scenes uh, like in this scene, there's two paintings in their scene when the sister and the and new husband finally uh, rejoin the uh, castle owners and talk to each other. Well, there's two paintings in, in oval shaped paintings, you know, uh, flanking a, a window. I mean, it, it's something. There's something in there. You know, if you have high resolution enough, you can see what those paintings are. You know, yeah. they all mean well, something. Every little this bit looks of like detail. A high scan. Right. It looks like a high scan, so we can see things. Well, right. this is kind of blurry now because it's YouTube. It's already on YouTube, <laughs> but if you have the original um, disc, it's yeah, it's sure. incredible. Yeah. Mm. But that's... anyways, that's kind of how I enjoy his movies. Is uh, still by still, because <laughs> uh, yeah, I can see. Oh, I like this hallway. Yeah, you have how to kind of let listeners know where kitchen. we are. Yeah. So, and what's creepy about there's a hallway that it is in the film where. It seems to be like these deer antlers is haunting the hallways. I just love that framing. Like as they walk back and forth through the hallways, there's just yeah. like, you know, dead animals posted at top. But this this entire film, there just seems to be a lot of background foreground stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Just super, super like. It's a very modern day film. For 1921. And that's why I I think I really enjoyed it a lot more, too. Right. Because there's just so much to look at. And it just impresses upon you that, you know, like we're saying, so much thought was put into this film, even if it was expressionism. I mean, that's that's some good expression right there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an evolution, I think, of expressionism. because Oh, definitely. They continue to... he, He kind of... Because he was, uh, he grew up. He's uh, friends with uh, Max, uh, I think Reinhardt, who's one of the originators, or uh, maybe not originator, but one of the people who really popularized this, that uh, aesthetic, the German expressionistic aesthetic on the stage. And of course, all of that eventually brought an influence, you know, into the film, uh, uh, films like Caligari and Murnau's films. I think Student from Prague might be it early example uh yeah for sure any of those you know call any germanic Weimar republic uh films from yeah. that era they're heavily heavily inf- it it is almost unimaginable to have films that weren't at some shape way or form uh influenced by the expressionism movement of the stage right but um any other notes on any uh other areas of the film let me pop it back up. Um, My only note was uh, with the Baroness uh, Olga something something. I didn't write down her full name. I just – my one acting critique was just – I was so aggravated by how she always had the same boring, plain, miserable, brooding face. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't That was just like a comment. It's just – I know she's miserable. I know she's upset. But it, it was just always the same. Yeah. Even her makeup made it – seem like very dreary and unhappy 
I, but it's just like you can play with it in more ways than just always having a stone cold face. So that was just my point. Uh, I was kind of surprised because she's done a lot of incredible movies along with others in the, plenty of others in the silent era. So it was just, it was a unique choice to have her be so yeah. stagnant until she is with the father. But even then, it's still kind of similar. She was different when she went in that flashback. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, she, well, as the movie does go on, we do find out she kind of, she's empty now. Right. Before he, but before he found religion, she was, you know, she was in love, but after that, it, even then, it was kind of the same. But, after that, she just wanted to be evil. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of. <laughs> that was funny as. <laughs> Very interesting. I just want to see something evil. <laughs> I was like, okay. I think I'm done. <laughs> Any other notes? I, the thoughts? kids just popped in and out of the story. That's about. That was interesting. Yeah, the kid was funny. <laughs> he was cute. It's like suddenly they're there and then they're gone. It's like it was like Dick Van Dyke's show. What? Do they still have a kid? What? <laughs> I will say I did like the humor he did put into this movie, though. It it yeah. worked well. Obviously, we don't know what the jokes were, but having that literal release attention seemed to really bring you in more, so you understand who these characters are and what's going on with them. So I did enjoy that. I thought it was very smart to have it in such a movie like this because it already a little is. Little Downton Abbey. A... Yeah, a little a little Downton Abbey, <laughs> but because it well, is with the kind kitchen, of a when thriller. They went... Well, they went upstairs, downstairs, you know, so you got to see the kitchen help. So that's made me think of Downton Abbey. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I've hit the end of mine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think showing that uh, kitchen life, uh, like the downtown reference you had, I think is more about the class. Because clearly yeah. this is a, even in the, um, I guess, the 20s, you know, they're in transition of going from a more Victorian lifestyle, I guess, into a yeah, more modernized yeah. lifestyle. And, and well, the even, story, I'm sure, was older. Yeah. It is, but even then, I think life then was in transition, going from people houses with servants right. into just you know, <laughs> you know, modern. The butler class. didn't really do anything, but for some reason, I couldn't stop watching him. There was something about him that just looked interesting, and I was waiting for him to do something, but he never did. <laughs> mm. We'll say, yeah, even yeah, all these characters are characters, which is yeah, really yeah. good because a lot of times you have they just fall off the screen. Dimension. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah they have all they all have third dimension you all kind of want to know a little bit more about them yeah i thought the butler for sure was going to be in on something but um no he was just there as a prop it's like a murder mystery right like clue a little bit yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. oh yeah i love clue. Uh, yeah so here's the I antlers in this scene <laughs> you know the antlers at the top mounted in the walls i didn't even notice the ones that were in the background so that's cool yeah, oh, yeah it's incredible just everything about it is incredible the the more you study his films uh the more you and then of course the central oh, lamp there he it's, is the butler yeah and also the lamp there's the lamp is almost in every one of these archway hallway scenes it's got to signify something right yeah a and light it has illuminating a color. the darkness yeah so, so why do you think they call it a castle well i mean if you look I mean, at the the model it's it's the whole castle, right? It's not castle in the think... traditional sense of like a uh, brick, you know, with the fort and the, the stone, moat. yeah. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's a European castle, right? So. <laughs> oh, I never saw. I would looking at. I would just say mansion. Yeah, mansion. Uh, right, right. It just seemed weird to pick that title, and not really have anything to do with it. Well, it might be yeah. one and the same. I think language-wise, in the uh, context of the film, right? In that's their story. true. It was German. Right. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Anyways, I feel like there's uh at least for me personally, there's just a uh uh endless amount you can kind of ring out of this. Uh where what each of characters do, even that comic relief character, like you said, yeah, has his own dreams, has his own like nightmare of uh uh and that's where the German expressionist uh thing really comes out a lot, mm -hmm. I think during his nightmare scene. Right. Where, you know, all of a sudden this arm comes out and reaches 
you know, into his room. <laughs> yeah, that was really creepy, but I liked yes. it a lot. Yeah. It just seems and to be like... And they that with uh, the kid having his dream about right. getting... getting. Yeah, that was his... really funny, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I... I feel like I could go on, but I think that's probably good enough for this week. Right, you guys? Yeah, I'm good. I mean, I was going to say, did we exactly mention the plot twist at the very ending? I mean, oh, sure. Like... You can you can mention the plot. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, basically, we find out... I I don't know if we it's pronounced Count Osh, but that's how I was saying it to myself. We find out that the father is Count Osh, and he basically, like wrestles his own answers to try to find out why his brother was murdered so yeah. it's a it was a very unique ruse. he tricked the wife yeah yeah he tricked yeah. the wife yeah and uh <laughs> well what was funny earlier in the film too like you could tell the father's wig i'm gonna call it was so bad and fake yeah. i was like yeah. he's not bald what is this <laughs> like i thought it was <laughs> thought it looked awful but until the second half of the film when he came back then i noticed the the really dark creases in his brows. And I was like, damn, that looks like Count Osh. <laughs> and then at the very end, surprise, it actually is. But I, I actually thought it was very good makeup and, you know, wigging because I'm still I wondering if it's a different guy as an actor. Well, maybe the first half. Yeah, possibly. But I feel like they probably make it so they don't want it to be until maybe the very end. Cause now I want to rewatch it myself, but I'm st- I'm still hung up on yeah. the fact he got religion. I'm wondering if Fa- Father Farman had something to do with that. Because they were friends. So True. I wonder if he went up to visit him and somehow seeing Father Farman and his, you know, and his, his life inspired him to want to do the same. I don't know. Yeah, I certainly, I think there are ties because... It's so unexplained. You know, he yeah. just, he, he goes somewhere, doesn't say where or what. And then he comes back, and it just like a switch was pulled. You know so what happened? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess priests have this. Uh, it's almost like lawyers. Uh, you know, co- uh, client confidenti- confidentiality. Oh yeah. Where if oh, you. Yeah. yeah, they can't say anything. <laughs> you can tell them you murdered somebody, and they can't tell the cops. They've done a lot of law and orders about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think that's probably fictional, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think nowadays the priest will report you if you say I killed somebody. <laughs> I don't know. I that's still up in the air for me, but possibly. Uh, there's the model. <laughs> yeah. I just think of the the Thunderbirds when I see something like this. Well, I mean, models have have been a staple in classic films for a long time. You know, if yeah. you can't uh, shoot an exterior for a specific. Oh yeah. Uh, but I grew up with uh, with the marionette shows, so right. I can't help but put the two together. Right. Yeah, but they've been around since, of course, these era, right? These early days, because they, you know, you couldn't especially sci-fi. Yeah, you couldn't shoot. Uh, well, regardless, like even dramas, even movies like this, it's it, yeah. it's just the way things are. Because you can't, if you can't get that exterior shot of that castle or building or whatever is you for the look you want, the only way you can well, do it is through model. I love the hanging glass that gives you the second or third story to a, a situation. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, where they can't build the whole model. Say it's it was a huge set, so they put something in front of it, painted on glass, oh, right. to make it look like it's mm. bigger than it is. Yeah. Oh, the ex- uh, uh, set extensions. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, those are brilliant. They're always. I think great. you guys talked about it with. Um, uh, I forgot the name of it. The Charlie Chaplin one you just did. Oh, uh, City Lights. City Lights. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think he did that uh, every once in a while on his thing. Uh, he he probably used it extensively, but then they all did back then because they. Yeah, that's makes sense. part of movie magic. Movie magic making is that, yeah. you know, that's the illusion is that you have a larger set, you have a larger place than you. Right. You do like, if you look at like the scene that we're looking at now with the, you know the, the wife and this her husband as. It's probably on a set, but they got three branches in back, and, and you think you were actually oh, yeah. in the castle, right? So, yeah. Lily, were you going to sum up the thing, or I, I must have cut you off? What the, did you finish summarizing the rest of the twist, or the plot? Um, my, I mean, I was talking about how good I thought the makeup prosthetic was. Not that they exactly had prosthetics, but 
they use prosthetics in Nosferatu. Um, I just from watching it and then re- having that realization later, uh, I thought it was very good. Whether or not it is the same actor, because now I want to find out. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he looks looks like a completely different character. The only thing it gives him away right. is his very deep crested eye eyebrow wrinkles because <laughs> that's the one thing i was like hmm i wonder if that's him because you can't tell with the wig you can't tell with the beard and the mustache it completely covers his facial expressions yeah maybe maybe his eyes but that's why you're the glasses maybe that was are there to for. cement the uh twist so they used another actor and, so uh, you, you didn't guess it possibly that whole time Possibly. Now I feel like we should take a clip from later and then go back to the beginning. I actually watched it a couple of times, so I got it in the, the last time around. Hmm. But, uh... I mean, I guess just really that's the only way to summarize it. It's, uh... I liked the plot <laughs> twist because you're just like, oh! But, uh... Oh, jeez. I, I always keep forgetting their last names. Um, Osh? Not Father oh. Fairmond. I, I guess, no, the, I was going to say, I guess long, the Baron and Baroness. Yeah. I, I was... Yeah, I don't want to mispronounce it. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the ending was also a little bit of a shock, too. The the Baron, who's the, the new husband, oh, yeah. he ends up shooting himself over his guilt from getting caught. So it was just kind of like, whoa, why? <laughs> it was just to me, Plus I was the sound not expecting was that. Put with it too, with the music. But then the Baron is still the shot. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say she she's still <laughs> brooding. She's even more miserable now. So I don't know. Forget her. <laughs> Good. That's really all I have to say about the movie. Besides, I very much enjoyed it, and I was. So happy we could actually yeah. see the film. Nice. <laughs> not grainy, not terrible. It was just good all around. Yeah. So kudos to the restorers. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So without anything else, uh, we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, you can uh, find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watching silent films. Laurel.wordpress.com and send us an email at watching silent films at gmail.com. You can find us wherever podcasts are, and uh, if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating, star rating, or a review, it would greatly help uh, other silent film fans find us or just general film fans. And that's it for this week. So thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Adam. And uh, we'll see you all next time.